Hello, everyone. Welcome to the first, first event in the Student Bar Protection Center's Beyond Fresh Start panel series. My name is Persis Yu, and I am the Policy Director and Managing Counsel at the Student Bar Protection Center, and I am thrilled to see so many people join us today for this important and timely conversation on federal student loan default and collection issues. For too long, Defaulted student loan borrowers have slipped through the cracks and been, may, may, been ignored, all while made to suffer at the hands of the government's punitive collection system. In the years prior to COVID-19 pandemic and this historic payment pause, more than 1 million borrowers defaulted on a federal student loan each year. Despite the fact that borrowers had the right to affordable payments, which provided debt cancellation, and were supposed to end the epidemic of student loan default. As you'll hear more today, the consequences of default are financially disastrous for borrowers already experiencing financial strain or poverty. This runs counter, this runs counter to the intention of the Higher Education Act, which originally aimed to provide economic mobility through access to higher education. When federal student loan borrowers cannot afford their monthly student loan payments, the Department of Education, in conjunction with its servicers, debt collectors, and the Treasury Department, seize borrowers' wages, they take the borrowers' earned income tax credits and force older borrowers and borrowers with disabilities to lose some of their vital federal benefits designed to keep Americans out of poverty. In my time working with federal student loan borrowers, I have seen families lose their housing, seen workers lose their jobs, borrowers skip medications, parents struggle to keep food on the table. Often these borrowers would have qualified for a $0 IDR payment with time counting towards cancellation if only they could have navigated the department's Byzantine application process. The number of borrowers subject to this draconian system is also massive. Before the federal student loan payment pause, roughly 20% of, of the 43 million student loan borrowers were in default. And we know that student loan default is a critical racial, economic, and gender justice issue and that these punitive measures are disproportionately felt by women and people of color. Simply put, our system of student loan debt collection is broken. When President Biden ran for office, he made student loan borrowers big promises. He promised that he would make student loans affordable. He promised that he would fix public service loan forgiveness. He said that he would make sure that the government stopped taking borrowers social security benefits to repay their defaulted student loans and he promised he would cancel at least $10,000 for every student loan borrower. In short, President Biden promised to solve the student loan crisis. The Biden administration has taken some significant steps towards addressing the failings of our student loan system. Through executive action, the Biden administration is taking steps to address some of the failings of the public service loan forgiveness program and income drain payment by counting some of the times towards cancellation, which had been previously denied to borrowers. The, borrower, the department is also in the process of drafting new regulations in hopes of improving affordability and access to vital cancellation programs. But what about defaulted borrowers? Time and default was not included in the IDR account adjustment. Issues for defaulted borrowers were barely discussed at the department's fall rulemaking. Now, defaulted borrowers have not been completely ignored. On April 6th of this past spring, the U.S. Department of Education announced that it was taking steps to give a fresh start to millions of struggling borrowers by removing all federal student loan borrowers from default and placing their loans back into good standing. Fresh start is critical to protecting defaulted borrowers from the harsh consequences of default if payments resume in the future. But fresh start is not a long-term solution. Rather, fresh start is an opportunity for the department to reimagine how we as a society treat the most financially vulnerable borrowers and put an end to these punitive collection tactics. Earlier today, the Student and Borrower Protection Center released a comprehensive set of papers by some of the leading experts in our field. The papers in the Beyond Fresh Start paper series shed light on how the current system of default and collection further entrenches racial inequity, proposes ideas for reform and debt collection, identifies the roles that states can play in addressing default and helping borrowers, and outlines the legal authority for administrative solutions. Over the next three weeks, we have an exciting lineup of panels to discuss these topics along with, with those paper authors and some of the most innovative thinkers in our community. 
In a few minutes, we're going to hear from our first panel on the ways that student loan debt collection has failed to care for the most vulnerable borrowers and as we train the Higher Education Act's promise of access to higher education. Next week, we're going to be joined by U.S. Department of Education Undersecretary James Paul and a panel of legal experts whose proposals push the department to use its full authority to better protect defaulted borrowers. And in our final section, we're going to turn to the states and look at the vital roles that states can play to protect borrowers and ensure consumer protections. But first, before we do any of that, we're going to hear a few words from one of our champions on the Hill fighting day in and day out for student loan borrowers. Congresswoman Ayanna Presley from the Massachusetts 7th District has been a tireless champion for student debt cancellation and for lifting up the voices of those most impacted by crushing student debt and student loan default. Congresswoman Presley is an activist, a legislator, a survivor, and the first woman of color to be elected to Congress from the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Throughout her career, Congresswoman Presley has fought to ensure that those closest to the pain are closest to the power, driving and informing policymaking. I am so pleased that she has taken the time to join us by video today. I hope you will all please join me in welcoming Congresswoman Ayanna Presley. hurt and harm caused by the student loan industry. Each of you gathered here today knows that student debt is a transcendent issue. It is a fundamental kitchen table issue affecting people from every walk of life in this country. The elder forced to pay retirement to delay their retirement because of outstanding parent plus loans that help them get their child an HBCU degree. Or the young educators struggling to cover their student loan payments and the skyrocketing cost of childcare, or the custodial worker who feels they'll never get back on their feet because they've gone into default and just simply can't come up with a monthly student loan payment to get back on track. Now I hear these stories in every room, solicited and unsolicited. I hear them in every single room. These are the stories of millions of hardworking people who will have their lives changed forever, have their lives changed for good when President Biden cancels student loan debt. Now, let me be clear. This movement has never been stronger, and we've never been closer to getting this done, and that is because it is a movement driven by the people, a diverse, multi-generational coalition of people from every walk of life. We know that canceling $50,000 per borrower will help millions of workers and families get back on track. And in this nearly $2 trillion crisis, due to generations of policies like redlining, this debt has fallen disproportionately on the shoulders of Black families, particularly of Black women, women who are forced to take on higher student debt than our white counterparts just for a shot at the same college degree. Student debt cancellation will help reduce the racial wealth gap by nearly 30% and help millions of Black and brown folks finally achieve the dream of home ownership and building generational wealth. In this moment, as our nation works to recover from several layered crises, it would change lives. It would save lives to cancel student debt. Student debt cancellation is core to any just and equitable economic recovery from this pandemic. We cannot leave any worker, any family, any community behind. We are closer than ever to getting this done. I'm grateful and honored to be shoulder to shoulder to you in this fight, and we will not stop until it is done. 
Thank you. Thank you so much, Congresswoman. Thank you for, for joining us and helping lead this fight to protect student loan borrowers. Folks, as the representative said, cancellation is a critical issue of justice for our broken student loan system. One which has arguably harmed defaulted student loan borrowers the most. And critically, as we know, the $50,000 that Congresswoman Presley calls for a student debt cancellation would mean the total cancellation for approximately 95% of borrowers in default. Now, to help us dig deeper and uncovering the depths of the broken default system, I want to turn to our panel of experts. I'm truly pleased to introduce our moderator for today's panel, Danielle Douglas Gabriel from the Washington Post. Danielle is a national higher education higher education reporter who covers college affordability, accountability, and state and federal financial aid policy. In particular, I'm very excited about her reporting um, on student debt, on the, fail the government's failure to end wage garnishment during the pandemic, on servicing abuses, and in particular on highlighting the experiences of borrowers of color and in particular Black women who face student loan debt. Thank you so much for being here today. Please take it away. Thank you so much for the introduction, Persis. So glad to be here today. And thank you everyone for joining us. I'd, I'd like to welcome each of our panelists by having them introduce themselves and asking Dina and uh, Josh to tell us a bit more about their new papers. Deanne, how about you kick it off for us? Okay, there we go. Just getting the camera and uh, microphone. So thanks, Danielle. And, um, so um, I, I'm Deanne Lunin, and um, <clears throat> sorry, I'm, I'm here today in my individual uh, capacity, but I also, uh, I, I'm an attorney with the Project on Predatory Student Lending, and also was the, uh, for many years, the uh, director of the Student Loan Borrow Assistance Project at the National Consumer Law Center, and a legal aid lawyer too. So I've been working on these issues for a long time, and I'm very happy to, to be here today. Uh, just very briefly, we'll tell you what, um, what I wrote about today, um, and then we can, of course, talk about it more. But basically, coming out of the payment pause whenever that happens, and hopefully coming out of some comprehensive debt cancellation, we are going to need to start over, in my opinion. And so what I wrote about is the time for any kind of tweaking is over. It's time to really engage in structural, structural change. And specifically the proposal I have is about automatic uh, repayment through the tax system. And uh, in the meantime, given that that requires congressional action, some interim steps that the department and others can take. Um, so that's, that's my nutshell version. Josh. You're up next. Awesome. Thanks so much, Danielle, and thanks for having me. Um, I am, uh, my name is Josh Robinger. I'm an attorney at the Legal Aid Society of Cleveland. Um, my paper for this series uh, is focused on how the government's approach to involuntary collections uh, actively is undermining the purposes of the Higher Education Act. And Persis alluded to this a little bit earlier, but um, I dive deep into the history of that act to show um, that it was specifically designed to lift people out of poverty and to um, give meaning to the reconstruction amendments. Um, and then I turn and pivot to uh, where we are today to underscore the absurdity of the government seizing other anti-poverty programs all to pay back loans that were similarly designed. Uh, to lift people out of poverty. Thank you, Josh. Amber, can you introduce yourself? And then Abby, you will round it out before we start our questions. For sure. Hi, all. Uh, my name is Amber Sadler. I am a counsel at the Student Borrower Protection Center, where I do policy research and writing to sort of help end uh, student loan industry abuses at the root and also help develop uh, cases to vindicate student loan borrowers harmed by service or misconduct in the courts. It's really good to be here. Uh, 
Hi, uh, I'll, I'll go ahead and introduce myself now. Thanks, thanks for having me here. I'm Abby Shafroth. I am now the current director of the Student Loan Borrower Assistance Project at the National Consumer Law Center, standing on the shoulders of uh, giants Deanne Lunin and Persis Yu, who are prior directors of the of the project. And um, uh, I'm I'm appalled by by uh, by the current approach to student loan default and debt collection and eager to eager to talk about this important issue with all of you today. Thank you, Abby. So I'm going to pose all my questions to my entire panel and hopefully feel free to jump in whenever. But I figured just to make sure that uh, the audience were all on the same footing about how the system works. Can anyone take us through what happens when someone defaults on a federal student loan? What's the process? I'm, I'm happy to jump in here. Um, so what happens is a borrower, if a borrower becomes 270 days, so that's about nine months past due on their federal student loan payments, they enter into default. And when they when their, their loan enters default status, then suddenly the entire balance of the loan becomes immediately due. Uh, this is called acceleration. So the borrower is no longer just responsible for, for their, their current monthly payment, but for, for, for the, the whole balance can be taken from them immediately. Um, once the loan is accelerated, the loan holder can begin collecting uh, by taking money directly from the borrower's wages. This is called administrative wage garnishment by seizing federal payments, including social security payments and tax refunds, including the portion of tax refunds that are made up of the earned income tax credit or the child tax credit. Um, and it can also sue you, although that's less common because sort of why bother? Uh, if the government can directly just go after your wages and your federal payments, there's little need to, to have to sue and seek a court order to, to, to get at your assets. Uh, the default is also reported to credit reporting agencies, harming borrowers' credits, credit and making it more expensive to, to borrow for a car or to uh, borrow to buy a home. Uh, and it renders the borrower ineligible for new federal student aid, including Pell Grants. Um, this is a problem for many of the, the low income clients we serve who, um, who defaulted after, after being taken advantage of and preyed upon by, by predatory schools and weren't able to complete their program or completed but got little value. And now they're, they're, they're coming to us interested in going back to school, to going to a community college, uh, but they can't afford to do so because their default prevents them from accessing federal student aid. Uh, so that's, um, that's my sort of first cut at it. What am I leaving out? Well, I would just add, and that was great, Abby, that um, much of this is unprecedented, uh, unprecedented and extraordinary collection powers, as Abby mentioned, but Another extraordinary thing is the lack of statute of limitations. So this collection, once you're in default, unless you're able to get out of default, the collection can literally last forever. Um, and that too is unusual. Yeah, so, so the only thing I'll add to, to uh, both Abby and Deanne's points are, um, you know, one, I think it's I think it's important. I think this was implied by both of their comments, but we should explicitly say that this is not how debt collection typically occurs, right? Like in the typical course, if someone, for instance, defaults on their car note, the holder of the note has to take the person to court. The debtor has the chance to make up the debt, has the chance to settle the case, can simply just prepare for that ultimate judgment against them. And this is entirely different. Um, and then also kind of layered on top of that in the normal course, you know, bankruptcy is traditionally an option for folks who um, find themselves in debt. Whereas in this context, not only does the government have this extraordinary authority to collect on student loan debt, um, but then denies students in most instances uh, the chance to get out of it through bankruptcy. So we actually have an audience question, I think, that kind of builds on this particular part. Uh, doesn't the student have 90 additional days after the 270 days before it goes to the debt management collection system? Can anyone talk a little bit about that aspect of the overall process? I mean, that's practically, that's correct. I mean, it's as the definition at, at the 270 days that Abby mentioned is what is that's the standard in the regulations for default, but, um, and, and 
without going too far into the weeds of the, the prior program, the guaranteed student loan program, what, what we call FELL, which, which ended in 2010, but there's still a portfolio. In those cases, um, it, it, most of the time that the, the loans actually did, the collection process did actually begin at 270 days. So it's now under the direct loan program, which is almost all uh, government lending, it is true that uh, it, it's honestly at a, administrative, I guess you call it like bureaucrat, bureaucratic uh, kind of pause or, 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 or extension, I guess, actually during that 270 to 360 before the collection actually begins. You guys mentioned quite a few steps along the way and how borrowers can get trapped in each of them. So talk to me a little bit about what are some of the greatest pressure points in the debt collection system for borrowers? Uh, pressure. So, you know, I think um, what's interesting is that the, uh, the amount of I guess you would call kind of contact or communications you get accelerate over time. So, you know, what what seems like a relatively long period, not nine months or, or a little bit more of delinquency actually um, is a lot of contact in escal escalating contact from a, an entity of some kind. It could be the government, it could be a servicer, it could be, um, you know, former Sally May, Navient, whoever, and that's and that's actually a big pressure point. Others can mention others, I think, that um, you know, you often hear, well, from the servicer side, well, we just can't reach people or they won't talk to us and all that. But, you know, it's it's an it's an adversarial situation in many ways from the beginning with, with because of people who are under pressure, who may not think that their debts are legitimate if they went, for example, to predatory school or other thing. And so the entities um, that are actually supposed to be there to help them uh, um, already, there's there's problems with that relationship from the start, and it only gets worse actually over time. So one thing, you know, so so there are you know very specific pressure points within the debt collection kind of process itself. You know, for example. Um, there's only limited time to request review of, you know, a wage garnishment notice or a tax offset notice. And even there, um, kind of the process that exists is uh, fairly illusory. Um, but kind of, you know, bigger picture, I think it's really hard to disconnect the pressure points in the um, default collection system with the pressure points more generally. Like I think we have to be asking ourselves, how are students who are in default, how did they get there in the first place? And I think it starts at kind of the front end, you know, making the decision as a society that we're going to have debt finance education, then moving over to, you know, the Department of Education's oversight of schools and um, in particular, the failure to properly oversee predatory for-profit schools and how that ends up disproportionately leading folks down the path to, to default. Um, and then, of course, you know, the failure of loan servicers to get students into the right repayment plans um, to ensure that students are able to afford their monthly payments and avoid default. Um, and so, you know, as, as I think about the, the default kind of structure, the, the loan collection structure that we have right now, um, I think, you know, it, it's hard for me to disconnect it from the entire system and the failures that, that are uh, present more generally. And maybe to put a like a slight spin on your question, Danielle, but I think like it's important to to note the like the people that are pressured most at those pressure points and, and how. So just like underscoring some of the things that folks mentioned earlier, like the government can seize your uh, your federal benefits, your earned income tax credit, your child tax credit, um, your social security retirement and disability funds. Like these are things that are like, critical to people who are most already most feeling um, economic pressures and financial instability. And just it's a devastating, uh, devastating process. Yeah, um, that, that was also sort of my reaction to this question there, the pressure points in the 
in, in the sort of communications process and how the borrower um, uh, gets into default and experiences um, their interactions with the system. And then there's these pressure points around um, what is the what is the impact of the collection uh, mechanisms on the borrowers and and their families? Um, because remember, many of many of the borrowers who default, I think the date, recent data is over half of them um, have have children. So these 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 collection mechanisms are not just impacting them; they're impacting their kids, and uh, the impact is really intergenerational. Um, and a, a a really glaring problem in this system is that. The borrowers who um, who are sort of not connected with the income-driven repayment system, uh, often because poor, poor servicing, right, um, uh, end up having to pay much, much more when they're in default, um, either through the administrative wage garnishment program, where 15% of their income over $217 a week can be can be garnished from them. That works out to Let's see, I, I did the math somewhere. That works out to 15% of the amount they earn over $935 a month. Um, that's much less income that's protected from them versus a borrower who was in income driven repayment. A borrower in income driven repayment would have uh, probably half or more of their income protected uh, and would be likely to have a $0 payment in income driven repayment. So the borrowers in default, those who we know are financially struggling, are being asked to pay much more and are being left with far. Um, far, far less income and assets to survive upon. Uh, similarly, with income driven repayment, uh, I mean, sorry, with, um, uh, with, with the tax refund offset program, uh, many of the borrowers who are in default, uh, we, we believe are, are eligible for the earned income tax credit. This is an anti-poverty program where 98% of the benefits are, are, are directed towards families with children in, in, in prior years. Um, so this money is really uh, important money meant to meant to fight the problem of child poverty, uh, and it and it's a large portion of of these families' total annual income, and that entire earned income tax credit can be can be seized, uh, which might which might be thirty percent of the borrower's income for the year, as opposed to if they were in an income driven repayment program, they would likely have a zero dollar uh, payment if they are eligible for the EITC because of their 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 low family's low income level and their their household size. Um, but but even if they were subject to required to make some payment, it would be you know 10 percent of income above uh, a certain protected threshold. So um, so the amount that borrowers are being being forced to repay when they're in default are just uh, can, can really eclipse the amount that they would be expected to pay if they'd had sort of the good fortune of being able to access the income driven repayment program. I'm hoping we can talk a little. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Dan. I just wanted to piggyback real quick on something Abby said, um, which is a big point in, in what I wrote too, is that there are a lot of programs out there. There's a lot of relief programs and actually income driven repayment being one of them. If people were matched properly early on, you know, a lot of people wouldn't be in this position. And there's a whole variety of reasons why that happens why they're not matched. But one of them I wanna say is we've created a system that is so complicated and has so many barriers and hurdles you have to jump into to first understand and then actually get the relief that you are entitled to, that that's one of the, one of the biggest failures and why it doesn't work, but it may look pretty good on paper because, oh, you know, what are people complaining about? They can get this, they can get that. And I think as all of us together, actually, and myself having done this for so long, in a way, um, it's, it's, a, it's a failure that we didn't focus more on what actually happens on the ground, implementation, what the experience actually is for people. Because even if there are programs, if people aren't using them, it's, it's just the same as there being no program at all. I'm glad you mentioned that idea of programs that are on paper are supposed to be so great, but in, in practice do not live up to their potential. It, it really kind of offers a good segue to loan rehabilitation. Uh, this is one of the, the, the components of our current federal debt collection system for student loans that is often hailed as the solution. Right, you are you pay for uh, as, as little as five dollars, I think, uh, for nine consecutive months or so, and then you're lifted out of default. If that is supposed to be the easiest way for borrowers to return to good standing, why are there so many people? Why were there so many people in default prior to the pause? Where's the disconnect? I'll, 
I'll, I'll start, and I'm sure I'm sure others will jump in. Um, uh, I. I, I hadn't heard it described before as an easy way to get out of default, but um, if, if policymakers think it is, then uh, they are they're sorely mistaken. Um, so, so there are a number of barriers uh, and reasons that that rehabilitation isn't working as uh, as the pathway out of default. Um, you know, so first, not all borrowers are even eligible to rehabilitate their loans. Uh, borrowers who have um, who have already rehabilitated their loans one time, for example. Um, it, the, the, the current regulations make it sort of a one-shot deal. So, so if you rehabilitate your loans and, uh, and, and something happens and you redefault, sorry, that option is foreclosed to you. Um, that seems sort of needlessly punitive. Um, uh, additionally, there are other borrowers who, who may not be eligible for, for rehabilitation for other reasons. So some borrowers, it's just not, it, that, that door is closed to them entirely. Um, second, most borrowers in default don't know their student loan rights or options. That's why they're in default, right? Because they haven't been connected with uh, the various safety net programs that are supposed to exist and supposed to um, help protect, the, protect their ability to, to make ends meet and manage their student loan, uh, their student loan payment obligations. Um, there's no reason to think that the borrowers who are in default would, would, would be more likely to, to, to be aware of their their, um, their rights and options. And, and the rights and options are complicated. It is a big, complicated program. Uh, you know, I interact with student loan attorneys across the country on a regular basis. Many student loan attor attorneys have questions regularly, reasonably, about the student loan pr program and, and borrowers' rights and options. It, it's really complicated. Um, and we rely on, we rely on the, the, the companies that the Department of Education contracts with uh, to, to educate borrowers about their, their rights and options and to connect them with those options and help them access them. But time and time again, we've seen that that, that has failed, uh, that we've, we've uh, misplaced any trust in those companies. They've, they've, they've failed to, to make these connections. Um, third and finally, the, 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 um, the process isn't simple. Uh, it requires going back and forth with, um, with the, the company that is managing the, the rehabilitation that used to be a private collection agency. Now it seems to be Maximus with a DRG. So the, the borrower has to sort of request, a re, they have to find out if they have a right to a rehabilitation and who to find out who they should talk to about it. They have to then make the request for the rehabilitation. They have to sort of go back and forth with that entity to, to provide their income and document their income so that the entity can determine what's a reasonable and affordable uh, payment, rehabilitation payment for them to make. Um, and that's that's a lot of bureaucracy right there. I, I have uh, I have dealt with having to like fax some of this information back and forth. Like all of it seems to operate in like 1980s level of technology. Um, it, it is not easy uh, for, for for me as an attorney. It is not easy for people who um, don't have ready access to to various communication technologies. Um, and who, who haven't done this before, uh, which, which generally they haven't, because if they'd done it before, they wouldn't be eligible for rehab. Um, and then, then after that, you've got, you, you've got then the, the nine months that, that, that Danielle, you previously mentioned of, of on-time payments that the borrower needs to make. Um, and remember, like a lot of borrowers are in default because their financial and life circumstances are, are unstable. And it can be hard to, um, to, to hit that, that on-time full payment every month for, for that amount of time with, without, um, without a lot of like breathing room or, or uh, room for, for life to happen. Um, so it is, it is a, a long and complicated process that is not, not easy. And I'm sure I'm leaving other things out. So um, SBBC and NCLC just released a report on the challenges facing borrowers who are incarcerated. And um, shout out to Abby and Deanne, who were both amazing co-authors uh, on that report. Um, so incarcerated borrowers are very top of mind for me right now. And I think they're unfortunately a great example of the way the student loan system and programs like rehabilitation just aren't designed to consider borrow populations that deviate at all from the typical borrower profile. Um, so like borrowers who are older and have income earning limitations, those who have loans that are not a part of the direct loan program, but instead the FEL, the Federal Family Education Loan Program. Um, and incarcerated borrowers. So these borrowers, like they, they have the same obligations uh, as any other borrower to make their payments on time. If they can't make their payments on time because of economic or other hardships, 
which like sidebar, like those are the conditions of incarceration, economic and other hardships. Um, they have to affirmatively seek out and apply for rehabilitation to get out of default or apply for programs like income driven repayment to stay out of default and communicating uh, with your servicer, let alone for nine months to make these like timely payments like it's just it's impossible in the prison context where borrowers who earn pennies per hour um they have to pay for every stamp letter sent every minute of a phone call um, and they often lack internet access to even find the the addresses to send these letters the phone numbers to call um, it's just it's impossible and then it's important to remember that like as horrible as all that is like for borrowers who are incarcerated, there's that's just one subgroup of people who have difficulty navigating those. I think I think it was Persis or someone else earlier. He said Byzantine, like these like super old clunky systems, and it's just it, it, it's not designed for people with real problems to get through. Yeah. So I, I, I think. Oh, sorry, sorry, Jeff. No, good. Okay. Um, so, so I think. Abby and Amber are spot on. And I think the problems that they identify then also apply when someone does manage to get through the rehabilitation process. And then they need to figure out how to enroll in an IDR program, which their loan servicer has probably not you know, reminded them about. Um, and then even if they do get into that program, they need to recertify each year to ma maintain themselves in that program, which again, all of these various failures you know, creates roadblocks to that happening. Um, and so what we see is that even when people are able to rehabilitate, you know, there's a, a decent percentage that redefaults and then doesn't have the opportunity to rehabilitate again. Um, and the reason that they redefault are the, 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 the are stem from the same failures that led them to default in the first place. Yeah, and I, I would just add, agree with I'm, First of all, shout out to the to that um, report that Amber mentioned. I um, I only wrote a small part of it, so I can say shout out. But it's really important work. Um, um, and I just want to take one step back because how we got here is really important. Rehabilitation, if you look back as part of the FELT program, so before their direct loans, if you will find it in the statutory portion of the Higher Education Act that has to do with loan resale. Um, and it was actually set up honestly so that, um, you know, the, the goal in the, at the way at the beginning was to get lenders to participate in the program. So this was really a, meant to be a soft landing for participants in the FELL program. It was not like a borrower benefit from the beginning. And if you go back and look at other supposed, I guess, borrower rights or perks or relief, whatever, it's often, you know, that's how it started. Consolidation is the same way. You know, the two main avenues out of default were actually set up to uh, not with borrowers primarily in mind. Um, and I think that um, those they're relics, um, really. So so the, the Byzantine bureaucracy that everyone's talking about um, is in part trying to sort of, you know, prop up this thing that that for a program that doesn't even exist anymore. So, um, you know, Josh and Persis and, as negotiators in particular, and I'm sure others, you know, written really, really well on how there's nothing in the Higher Education Act that limits the get out of default programs to these two relics. You know, we could get rid of, you know, I keep them for now because they're what's available, but you could also get rid of the relics and come up with something that's actually um, putting borrowers first. Um, and this program for all the reasons everyone talked about from the inception was actually not even intended to be like a borrower benefit. Actually, Deanne, I'd like to follow up really quickly on the consolidation. We didn't really talk much about how that aspect of getting out of default works. Can you talk a little bit about how it works and why it is not living up to its potential? Yeah, and I, you know, and I'll um, try to keep it brief because uh, it's only because it, it, each of these has their own sagas, and again, without borrowers being first, but. Um, consolidation, again, was, was it's, it's not just a get out of default program. It's for people who are current on their loans too, um, with a, a convenience factor that's a very real convenience factor, which is if you have multiple loans, um, particularly when people had both say fell and direct loans and other things, you wanna put them together into one loan. Um, it, it's, some people call it like a refinancing, but 
you, um, it, it's sort of like that. You could literally have only one loan though and, and you actually consolidate it. Um, there's some reasons now to you know, consolidate to get into the direct loan program if you weren't in that originally. For example, to, um, to use the uh, PSLF, Public Service Loan Forgiveness or something else. But that's what it was from the beginning. It was intended to be a convenience uh, really for, um, for borrowers and for lenders really in a way too, so that they could not have to have say like 15 or 20 loans that they had to account for separately. Um, and so then it also became an, a, a way for people to get out of default so that you can, you can also on a one-time basis, you can consolidate out of default. And this actually was something that uh, a lot of uh, companies sprung up back in the 90s and early on to take advantage of that. And they would push people into consolidation just for the, because it was easier than rehabilitation. Um, but again, it's a one-time thing. So that actually often didn't work so well for borrowers. Um, so it's, 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 again, it's an imperfect solution. It's an easier way for borrowers to get out of default, but it's also um, ripe for abuse too, for people who maybe um, they lose some rights potentially by consolidating because you extinguish the old loan. And so it's something people really should enter into with counseling. Um, and as a way to get out of default, it works for people. You have to, um, you can you know, apply online, um, you can uh, immediately, it fills in, auto fills in what loans you have, and then they're going to consolidate them. If you're in default, they're going to add a fee to that, and then you have a new loan. Um, but, but there's no reason that I know of or, or no studies or anything to show like this is a, a particularly good way to help people whose main goal is to actually get out of default. I feel like you guys have all kind of touched on this a little bit, but I'm hoping we can further explore what, what do we know about the profile of borrowers in default, age of loan, type of loan, loan amount, demographics, and how can that data in particular inform policy reforms? So I'm happy to start on this one because I, I dug into this a little bit um, in my paper for the series. And, I'll focus specifically on the demographics of borrowers in default. Um, and I think there are a few things we know um, about them. So one, you know, the vast majority of them are low income, living paycheck to paycheck. Um, I think like 65% or so are below, living below the federal poverty line. Um, and a vast, a significant number of them rely on uh, other federal you know, depoverty supports uh, to sustain themselves and their families. Um, Two, largely the result of historical and ongoing systemic racism. Uh, we know that black and brown borrowers are disproportionately, uh, they disproportionately default on their student loans. Um, I think it's, the studies vary, but some research suggests that upwards of a third of all uh, black borrowers have defaulted on their federal student loans. Um, relatedly, students who attended for-profit schools um, disproportionately default on their student loans. Um, they also disproportionately have more debt to begin with than students who do not attend a for-profit school. Um, and I say the reason that's related is because uh, many you know, for-profit schools um, specifically target um, black and brown borrowers along with um, single mothers, veterans, um, and various vulnerable populations. Um, we further know that a, you know, a, a significant portion of older borrowers who have increasing amounts of student loan debt um, will default on their student loans. Um, I think something like 40% of those 65 and older with student loan debt default. Um, and then also students who do not complete their program. So don't, even if, you know, even, even um, don't, don't have a credential to, um, theoretically utilized as a result of the federal student loan debt. And about 49% of non-completers default on student loans. Um, kind of pivoting to what that tells us about you know, potential solutions. Um, you know, I, think, I think there are bigger questions embedded in that, whether um, this system as it stands can continue to exist at all. Um, but if it's going to, you know, at a bare minimum, I think it speaks to trying to find ways to halt collections of 
the various anti-poverty supports that we provide these various you know, categories of individuals. Um, but I'll, I'll let others speak on, on other aspects of those in default. Um, this is really just speaking on another aspect of Josh's amazing paper. Um, but I think one thing that's really key to note is like the history that Josh highlights in his paper. Everyone should read it. Um, and just realizing that these borrower groups that, that we just named, um, these are people who were already marginalized before being caught in the student loan debt trap. And they're precisely the people that the HEA was supposed to usher into like a better life and future through education. I think remembering this is important. Like it has helped us one because it like it just it adds a layer of insidiousness to the harms that they experience. Like it's just in, in default, it's outrageous. But two, it adds a layer of like urgency to the policy reforms. Like look at where we've been, look at how we got here. Um, and realize that this is egregiously, this is just like extremely unjust. Um, so I, I think it, the like the road is important to take note of as well. Yeah, if uh, if you guys will allow me to, to summarize a little bit, like to, to be sort of just crystal clear about this. There's now at this point ample data that 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 people with student loan, federal student loans in default are overwhelmingly from low income families or disproportionately people of color and are disproportionately first generation college students and students who went to for profit schools. Um, so these are these are all all people that uh, the federal student aid program was meant to to support to um, to help uh, provide them economic mobility and access to to higher education um, and secure financial futures and our, our current default practices are, are just doing the opposite of that. If um, uh, I'm also happy to, to, to address Daniel had also asked about data about sort of the, the amount of debt that is in default and the length of time that those accounts have been in default. Um, I'm happy to address that as well. Uh, although I'm glad that we started with the sort of who, who is in default and who's experiencing this harm because I do think that that's sort of central to the question of how we how we approach default and um, uh, the sort of um, uh, whether whether our approach is uh, consistent with the, the goals of the HEA. Um, so in terms of um, some of the, the, the more qu quantitative data about the loans in default, um, a few a few recent data points stand out to me. One is that um, uh, there are you know somewhere between I've seen data between seven point five ish million uh, loans in default and maybe closer to ten million loans that are in default or severely delinquent at the time that the, the payment pause began in March 2020. Um, and of those, uh, there are over 2 million borrowers with loans um, in default or severely de delinquent that have been in repayment for more than 20 years already. So these are people who've been suffering for more than 20 years with this debt. Um, and this is something that, that, that I and others, and including those at SBPC, have raised as a concern that our income driven repayment program, which is designed to ensure that, that borrowers have a light at the end of the tunnel and can have their student loan burden uh, relief from them after, after 20 years in the system, that it is really failing if we have, if we have 2 million borrowers who, um, who've, who've been in repayment for over 20 years and are still suffering in default. And uh, so I, I, I'm, I'm very pleased that the department has uh, taken steps to um, provide borrowers more credit towards income driven repayment forgiveness and to make sure that more borrowers who've been in repayment for over 20 years are able to, to get their loans for, forgiven now without waiting longer. But I'm disappointed that thus far the department has excluded borrowers in default from that relief. Um, that's, a, that's a major oversight and it's still something that the department could choose to correct. It could still, still identify that these borrowers who are in default are borrowers who should have for the most part been, been receiving zero dollar um, IDR plans if the system was working as intended. Uh, and who've been harmed most by the failures of the system and, and could just deliver that relief and get two, two, million, dollar, two million borrowers with, um, with really, really old loans in default out of the system and finally give them relief. Uh, that's something that, that maybe the department will still do and we're gonna keep, keep pushing for. Um, uh, I also wanted to, to briefly address the, the 
the balance of loans in default. So often people talk about um, that that uh, that lots of the loans in default are actually small balance small balance loans because borrowers took them out um, to attend a shorter term program or borrowers took out took out loans uh, to go to school and weren't able to complete and that those are certainly factors that lead um, that that contribute to, to borrower default. Uh, so about about half of the loans in default are um, uh, have balances of under ten thousand dollars. And, and you know, a widespread debt cancellation would do a world of good for those borrowers. Uh, I don't want to leave out though that 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 means there's another half of the half of borrowers with loans in default who, who owe more than ten thousand dollars on their student loans. Uh, so there there would there would still be a lot of borrowers um, suffering with loans in default even if ten thousand dollars were forgiven uh, and if a, a larger amount were 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 canceled, um, then then that could do a lot more to address the the. The suffering that borrowers in default are experiencing. 95%, I believe, of borrowers with loans in default uh, have balances under 50000 I feel like we've mentioned IDR a couple of times, and just to make sure that the audience has, has a full understanding of what the program is and how it works, and particularly why it's not keeping borrowers out of default. Can anyone kind of dive in here and just give folks the lay of the land as to how this program is supposed to work? and why it's not, again, living up to its potential for defaulted borrowers. I'll let those of you working more recently on it, uh, let's start with that. Uh, uh, although, but I will add that, you know, one thing is it's not available to borrowers in default, um, which is a huge, problem. So, um, and, and we talked about earlier, rehabilitation uh, is sort of meant to, to be kind of like a, uh, what do you call it, like a, a, a ramp to IDR by making those payments during rehabilitation, but um, actually you can have a zero payment under IDR. So, so that's a separate problem. But, um, you know, I just, just real quickly and we'll let others talk about how it's working currently. Um, there, there's a number of different, in, income driven repayment is the umbrella, and then there's a lot of programs underneath that, which is part of the problem. It, it's not as many as I think sometimes people try to make the point there's like, I don't know, 50 or 60, there, you know, there's not that many, but, but there are more and too many acronyms for, for anybody. Um, but, um, and part of it's because of the FEL versus direct split, and also part of it's just honestly because Congress has not acted in, in a long time, and so you know, there's a lot of this has been done separately through regulation. Um, but, you know, the overall premise of all of the programs is that you should only have to pay an amount that is affordable tied to your income. Um, and so, you know, in, tying it to income even in and of itself is a problem because that's that's not necessarily always the best way to measure somebody's financial health, but that was the, the way that I think was considered the most convenient. Um, and then, um, you know, others can talk more about this, but, but one of the reasons why it has not worked very well is because um, of the lack of automation in it. So that people have to not just apply for it and then, you know, recertify, but that um, right now, of course, there's a payment pause. So everything's sort of, you know, artificially not the way it probably will be again in the future. But um, the, the idea would be that there should be, um, you know, an, an automatic way for the government to capture the income information. And, and I know, you know, Persis and others have written about this and just wrote a new paper about that. So I'll let others speak about that. But that's a big reason why a lot of people, uh, it doesn't work to keep people out of default is because the attrition rate is so high, even for people who are able to get over the barrier to entry and actually start in it. Yeah, I, I feel like Deanna ended up uh, actually actually covering the topic really well. Uh, and the only thing maybe I'd I'd add is to to put a fine point on it is that um, under under the current practices, at least the borrower um, not only has to like fill out paperwork and document their income and request the the income driven repayment plan to to initially enter it, but um, but Deanna talked about the, the the attrition and the difficulty of staying in the program. Part of this is because borrowers are. A big part of this is that borrowers have to, to sort of basically reapply every single year um, and, and do so on time. If they don't do it on time, then they get sort of kicked out of the program or they get kicked into a, a higher monthly payment. They get confused what's going on. 
um, it's it's like a, a big it's a pretty big burden on people to to ask them to um, to re reapply for uh, for a student loan repayment program every year for for twenty to twenty five years is the, the amount of time borrowers are expected to, to stay in the program before they can uh, eventually have their, their balance forgiven if the if everything is uh, worked as it is intended to work uh, which so far it has not. Um, so it's a it's a just sort of like a really big bureaucracy to, to navigate and just um, uh, the annual pay, paperwork uh, process has meant that that many, many borrowers um, who, who should be benefiting from income driven repayment uh, are, are, are not and uh, that the some of these sort of gaps between who would most benefit from the program and who's actually in it are the biggest for for low income borrowers and borrowers of color. Quick follow-up, Abby. I was just wondering what you thought of, I think, the Future Act provision that's supposed to make a more seamless uh, research by allowing IRS data to populate through the education department. Do you think that that would address some of these concerns or, or is it not enough, really? Yeah, so I hope so. You know that that um, the Future Act was was passed a while ago now, and uh, we have been eager for it to be implemented. Um, you know, I would I would love to see it implemented before uh, before any repayment resumes. Um, it seems to, to me like a, a natural that we know this is a major problem with our student loan system and the the failure of the existing relief programs to function is that um, it's too complicated and we've 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 made it unduly burdensome. Um, why not, you know, why not before turning on the system automate it so we can like much more easily um, get people back into repayment and in, into repayment plans that are affordable to them. Um, I'm disappointed that it hasn't like that implementing this hasn't been prioritized more uh, because it's so it's it's so critical to to the as Dan mentioned before, you know, the the, the plans and relief programs that look good on paper actually translating to uh, relief for borrowers. Um, so I do think I do think it could potentially go a long way. Um, I'm not so bright eyed that I think it will be perfect um, and there will be work to be done to get borrowers um, sort of authorization to have their their information shared. That's one hurdle that uh, the department's going to have to sort of think, think through how to make that happen. Um, but 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 certainly it could go a long way towards um, making it easier for borrowers to get into and stay in an affordable repayment program. So one thing I just want to quickly add that's layered on top of all of this is just the psychological burden that borrowers are actually experiencing year to year, even if they're able to get into an IDR program. Um, because what the borrower is seeing is, for example, if they have a zero dollar payment, their interest growing and growing and their overall balance growing and growing. And you could imagine with you know, a timetable of 20 to 25 years, that burden can add up. So you could imagine a world instead where one, that timeline is much shorter, um, or two, where you know, the Department of Education each year someone is on an IDR program forgives a portion of that debt. Uh, but as it stands right now, I, I do think it's important that we you know, recognize that like, literal psychological harm that's being done to borrowers as a result of the way the system functions. So I'm going to pose one more question and then we're going to shoot it over to audience questions. In the meantime, I asked the audience, if you have any questions for our panelists, please feel free to put it in the chat. We will try to get to all of your questions before the end of the session. So guys, what if any element of the existing debt collection apparatus are, is worth saving uh, or salvaging and what should be trashed and lit on fire? So... I feel like I, I shouldn't start because I have a contribution for the fire pit, um, <laughs> but I'm, I'm gonna. Okay, so I think that there's a real problem um, with the federal government contracting private companies to implement these really punitive consequences of default that we talked about up top, wage garnishment, uh, seizure of, of benefits, and then just kind of abdicating oversight responsibilities. Um, so just namely, and an example, um, there's this company called Maximus Federal Services. Uh, Abby mentioned them earlier. Um, they operate the department's default resolution group and debt management collection system. And they've done that for nearly a decade and yet almost no one knows who they are. Um, this company is like an unknown quantity in the student loan system. And 
it's not like uh, they've been up managing the defaulted uh, student loan portfolio so smoothly that no one would need to know who they are. Um, it's borrowers in default have sued Maximus for causing the illegal seizure of their tax refunds, uh, for failing to turn off wage garnishment uh, after they were defrauded by for-profit colleges, uh, for misleading borrowers about how to consolidate their loans out of default. And the company has been able to do all of this under the auspices of the Department of Education, which makes it like difficult to impossible for borrowers to even identify the company to seek redress in courts, but also makes it difficult for those borrowers who do file suit um, to like, defeat the company's sovereign immunity defenses and prevail. Like the, the company will say, well, we basically are the government um, for these purposes. Um, and so we, we're not accountable for the, the harm that we've caused. Uh, so that's a very long way of saying that I think that we need to trash the parts of the system that allow private companies who are focused on profit uh, to operate with all of the powers of the federal government and none of the accountability for, like, for the public good. And hopefully someone can come in with something more positive. Oh, I, I don't have something more positive. So that, but, but I'll, I'll come in anyway, which is, uh, I agree with you, Amber, but I, so I don't think we should keep anything from the current system. And that's um, the proposal I have, I wrote about is, is a new system. Um, but given that that requires congressional, uh, will require congressional action on a number of levels. Um, and so I'll address maybe a little bit of what to do in the meantime, but, but, but my, my basic answer is scrap it all and, and recognizing in part, this is not just to be glib at all. I mean, this is, you know, serious, it, it's, it's failed. And part of the reason it's failed is that there is an inherent sort of structural conflict of interest at the heart of the whole program um, with, with the government doing the lending, the gatekeeping, and then also, you know, having some uh, you know, fiscal responsibility as, as the collector also, but also having a responsibility to be the entity that is in charge of ensuring that borrowers have the rights they're entitled to. So there's conflict um, all along the way there, which, which could be, you know, uh, addressed, um, but, but not equally, you know, somebody's got to have priority. I, I would argue, you know, the student borrowers are the ones who have priority and that hasn't been how it's, how it's been. So that's like the main reason I think that we have to scrap the whole thing. Um, but in the meantime, and I won't get into all the details, I have a number of ideas of what we can do in the meantime. Um, but one thing I would say, uh, just one point I wanna make that it's not just a statutory barrier um, to change you know, in the Higher Education Act. The Debt Collection Improvement Act is a huge barrier because that's where the authority comes from for all the things people have been talking about, the tax offsets the social security offsets, um, it, to some extent, the, the administrative wage garnishment too. And so, you know, at a minimum, there needs to be congressional action to increase the floors so that the pain is not as bad. Things like social security offsets where there's a floor of $9,000 a year, that's how much people are allowed to keep. And imagine what that means, $9,000 a year, $750 a month, that is not, a floor it was set in 1996. It's you know it's it's cruel and outrageous. Um, but there's also ways, frankly, to until we can get rid of all of this, to make sure that the actual due process that there is built into the existing collection system is actually followed. Um, and so, for example, the Department of Education is required to certify and send debts over to the Treasury for collection. But those are supposed to be only enforceable debts. And we don't know, we think there's no rigor really to that certification process. So things like that, if they if we actually sort of had some real oversight to make sure that um, there was some rigor to this um, you know, sort of cruel and unusual system, then at least it would be a little less painful for people until we can actually change the whole thing. So, so I just want to pick up where Deanne just left off on kind of the pain that this causes um, and as a way to get to Danielle, your question. And, you know, we've been talking a lot about kind of 
the immediate effect, the garnishment of wage, the offsetting of taxes and seizing of you know, the EITC benefit. But that has cascading effects for individuals. That means going without food or medicine for themselves or their children. That means losing either a down payment on a house or um, a security deposit on an apartment for someone in their family. Um, it means being unable to pay other debt that is going to also compound in the meantime. Um, it means not being able to spend money to help family members who also may need it um, or to secure childcare for your family. Um, and so, you know, to, to your question, Daniel, is, is what can we say with this system? I won't answer it directly, but I will say I don't know how a system that yields these impacts can be just. Uh, so I, I, I have a similar reaction, not a lot to, to uh, preserve, um, but but maybe as a sort of nod towards preservation, um, uh, that there's aspects of the um, repayment system for borrowers who are not in default that should be preserved and expanded to apply to borrowers who are in default. So um, this is, I think, pretty consistent with, with Deanne's paper and with some of Josh's proposals. Uh, but in general, the, the sort of fundamental problem I see with, um, with, the, with our default program is that we've unintentionally created a two-tiered student loan system. One system for borrowers who are in uh, repayment status, and these borrowers are um, uh, more likely to be from middle class families. They are more likely to have been traditional students. They're more likely to have uh, completed their um, a four year college program. They're more likely to have had parents who went to college themselves. Um, uh, they're more likely to be white and uh, they're more likely to um, uh, have, have just a lot more resources and support in their lives and familiarity with the higher education system and student, student financing system. Those borrowers have a number of protections available to them. They have a, a, the ability to um, uh, temporarily stop payments on their loans using forbearances. Most importantly, they have the protection to enter into an income driven repayment plan and have 150% of the federal poverty threshold applicable to their family totally protected and to pay only 10% of their income above that amount. So that's, that's one system. Um, and then we have another system uh, for, for borrowers in default. And this is a group, this is a, the system that applies to the borrowers who disproportionately come from families that are, are, are near or below the, the federal poverty line. Uh, they're more likely to have dependent children. They're more likely to be single parents. They're more likely to be black. They're more likely to have attended for-profit schools. They're more, less likely to have completed their program. For this group of borrowers, we have a system, uh, a really complicated system, where they almost never have 150% of their income uh, above the poverty level protected. In fact, they have much lower amounts. They have, if they're in Social Security, they only have $750 per month protected. Um, if they're uh, subject to administrative wage garnishments, they're, they're, they're only getting uh, about $900 a month protected. Um, they don't have any of their, their earned income tax credit that's meant for, to, to lift their children out of poverty protected. Uh, so, so they're, they're facing, they don't have the ability to just sort of stop, stop making payments or collections on their, their loans by, by raising their hand and, and requesting a forbearance. They're in a much harsher system where they're expected to pay much more. Um, and it's, I don't think that this was intentional. I don't think anyone was like, hey, this would be a great idea. We should set up this system that's like really punitive for, for uh, people who are new to, the, new to the higher education system and who need more help uh, and who, um, who, who are struggling to access benefits and a better system for, uh, for, for, for people who are um, more traditional uh, college students and who um, have more have more resources available to them. I don't, I don't think there was any sort of malintent here. Um, I think it's just been um, unintentional and sort of neglectful and turning a bit of a blind eye to the problem of uh, 
who's in default and what the, the practices are applicable to them. And so if we could, if we could sort of import more of the ideas uh, that are that that the department that Congress is looking at um, uh, in terms of what we should do about borrowers in repayment, what protection should be available to them, how the system should work, how much of their income they should be required to play, and, and try to sort of establish some parity <laughs> uh, between the systems. And I think this is essentially sort of Deanne's proposal um, in, in a nutshell, um, then, then, then that would seem a, a much more much more just and reasonable system. So I'm gonna take start with some audience questions. One that's Pretty technical, but a great question. Um, so if a borrower is in default from pre-pandemic in default uh, and wants to take advantage of the public service loan forgiveness waiver, what should they do? Should they wait for fresh start and possibly miss out on the waiver or start re loan rehabilitation now to make the waiver deadline? So I'll just say, I think this underscores one of the pro, as, as great as the PSLF waiver has been, I think this underscores one of the central problems with it, that it um, leaves out individuals who are in default, um, who you know, may have been working in the public interest for the past 10 years and may otherwise be qualified um, for PSLF relief. Um, so I, I can't give, you know, specific advice on this one, but um, I have found that um, the uh, Obsplitzman's office at the Department of Education is helpful um, for specific questions like these, um, but otherwise we'll, we'll turn it over to others in the group for more concrete advice. I'm not really the PSL waiver person these days. So, or, I don't know, per, or, or Abby and Persis or Amber, you guys probably have more. So, someone might have um, a more specific advice. I, I share Josh's concern with trying to offer specific advice and you know, without without knowing all, all the details and sort of what types of loans they are and whether they would be eligible. Uh, but I, I guess my general point would be yes, <laughs> contact contact the ombudsman if you're if you're uh, not getting good information from your servicer, which unfortunately <laughs> often you're not. Um, and and um, in general, I, I would be hesitant to, to wait on Fresh Start. I'm excited about Fresh Start. It offers a lot of um, a lot of good and the opportunity to try to you know create a little bit more parity between the two systems I, I, I mentioned by allowing more borrowers from the bad system to get into the good system, the better system. Um, uh, but um, but we don't know. We haven't been given details yet about when it'll happen or how easy it will be. And so I'm. Um, and be reluctant to tell people to sort of like sit on sit on their their rights and wait and hope that fresh start goes well. So a couple of questions kind of touched on this issue of the difference between federal and private loans. So I'm, I'm hoping someone can talk a little bit about um, the differences between how default works in the federal space versus the private space and why that discrepancy exists in the first place. Uh, well, I, I can talk about that. Um, uh, the why, I'm not sure, but I'll start with the what. Um, the the uh, basically um, the way I usually explain like federal and private is that you know the the federal side. The good news is theoretically you have all these rights we've been talking to that are um, statutory or regulatory. You know they're not just based on whatever the lender chooses to give you. Um, but as we know, there's problems with actually getting those. And then the bad news is that the government has all these, if you get into trouble and default, has all these collection powers that we've also been talking about. Private loans are the reverse with a few exceptions, um, which is that, you know, the, the good news is that private entities do not have that same array of collection powers. They basically, if you get into trouble, um, they basically have the collection powers that any other private creditor has, which generally means that they have to sue you and get a judgment and then try to collect it. Um, and then, you know, you have uh, state-based um, sort of exemption laws on, on whether they, what, what they can collect and not collect. Um, you know, so, so that's the good news. The bad news is that 
you don't have any statutory or regulatory rights for relief. Um, you have whatever the lender might choose to give to you. Um, I shouldn't say you don't have any. I mean, there's there's things like the FTC holder rule and other things which, which we won't get into, but basically like relief, income driven repayment, that kind of thing, a lender could choose to create a program like that and, and you know put that into your contract. But most of them are pretty cagey about that and will say, you know, call us if you have a problem. Um, the default itself is also defined in the private loan context by the lender. Um, and so you actually have to look at your promissory note or your actual loan documents to see, you know, what the trigger conditions are for default in your private loan. Um, in, you know, I've looked at lots of these. Um, the loan, the private loan market has changed over time. So there were there was a very, very strong predatory subprime uh, market, at least with traditional private lenders in the past. They're they're now they've morphed into I guess you could call non-traditional and there's um, SBPC and NCLC and others have written a lot about that. Um, but at least traditionally, um, there were some really tough default triggers. Basically, they would accelerate the whole loan even if you just missed one payment. If you had a co-signer and there was, you know, the, the co-signer uh, fought, you know, declared bankruptcy, then they could actually accelerate the whole loan, things like that. Um, but each, each, honestly, it's an ind individual situation and you'd have to check and see what the specific default conditions are in, in your private loan. Um, the, the only other thing I'd say about private and federal that's really important, Josh mentioned earlier, the bankruptcy limitations. Um, th this is, I won't go to, it, this gets a little bit complicated, but um, you know, for the most part, um, both private and federal are treated um, they're, they're harder to discharge in bankruptcy than other types of consumer debts. There's some promising developments in that area where you know a lot of private loans actually might not meet the definition of a of a, a educational loan threshold wise for bankruptcy purposes. But in general, just know that it's it's going to be harder to get bankruptcy relief whether you have a federal or a private loan. So I think we threw this term around a lot, but probably didn't give enough explanation. Fresh start. Can any of our panelists kind of give folks a lay of land about fresh start? And I will preface that by saying, Abby did mention that there's not a lot of information that has been released yet, even though that program was announced in April. And every time I check in to see where the information is coming, people tell me not yet, but that's a whole nother conversation. So anyone want to talk about the basics of what fresh start is supposed to accomplish? Yeah, so um, what, what it is supposed to accomplish is, um, is uh, removing, removing the borrowers who are currently in default from default, putting them back into repayment so that they can once again um, access all the, the income driven repayment plans, uh, can access um, additional federal student aid if they want to go back to school, um, can um, uh, re-enter repayment with improved, improved credit. Um, so it's supposed to, to remove the, the, the default notation from, from um, their credit reporting, uh, remove the, the, the block on accessing um, uh, federal student aid if they want to go back to school and, and uh, put them back into sort of good standing in repayment. Um, there, um, there, there's unfortunately not a lot of information yet about sort of when that will happen, what will borrowers will have to do to take advantage of it. If anything, it sounds like probably they will have to act that it won't be um, fully automatic. Um, and, but, um, but we don't, we don't know yet. And uh, we would, um, we're, we're trying to find out. We, we think borrowers, uh, borrowers should know, uh, the public should know, people who, who try to help borrowers should, should know these details. Um, uh, but we're, we're, we're hopeful that this will um, uh, significantly reduce the, the, the number of people who, who are um, in default. And Abby, Abby, can I ask you a question on this too? Because um, this is, and maybe you said this, I'm sorry if you did, but it's time to the end of the payment pause, but couldn't it be something, or I said, does it have to be time to the end of the payment pause? That's my question. Have they signal, made any signals about that? Yeah, I don't, uh, well, I, I think the idea is that it is supposed to happen sort of, that borrowers are supposed to, the, the language is borrowers to, would enter repayment um, in, in good standing or have this opportunity to enter repayment uh, re, or re-enter repayment in good standing. Um, my understanding had been that it could happen, that it could and probably should happen before the, the end of the payment pause, um, uh, just to remove, you know, reduce the number of moving parts and also like 
get get people out of, of default sooner is uh, is better. Um, uh, but um, but the, the 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 rumblings I've heard is that it, you know that it won't be a sort of point in time like one day eight million people are in default, the next day zero people are in default. Uh, that it'll be a, a longer process and that that um, that it will probably require something on the borrower's part to sort of raise their hand and say, say they want to participate. Um, and so in that case, that, that there needs to be time for borrowers to, to learn about and speak to um, to DRG or their servicer or whoever that is that they, they ultimately need to 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 speak to to um, to participate in the program. Yeah, and I also just to flag thanks thanks on that that you know, as we talked earlier about a lot of people in default also went to for-profit schools and so may be eligible for discharges through the uh, un unfortunately wide array of different ways to get your loans discharged right now. So I don't know timing wise also since those, if, if their loans are not discharged through borrower defense or closed school or whatever, by the time the payment pause is extended, those loans are supposed to stay in forbearance and how that will interact with potentially coming out of default is sort of another potentially kind of like complicating factor. And then, yeah. go ahead. Sorry, circling back to the like the fell conversation a little bit. Um, I, I think, and others on the panel might have more insight into this than I do. Um, but I think that like we're still like there's a lot of questions still about what borrowers will be eligible. Like we don't know if for we don't know for sure if commercial fell borrowers will be eligible for Fresh Start. Um, and this has been a like a problem throughout the like the servicing system and like relief relief being provided for again borrowers who stray off the beaten path of the typical borrower like that you don't have a direct loan so whoops um you're not eligible for the covid um payment pause or zero percent interest rate um or you don't have a direct loan you have a commercial fell loan so we're not the, the government is not able to guarantee that um, wage garnishment will be turned off for you um, during the pandemic or that uh, your tax refunds won't be uh, seized during the pandemic while other federal student loan borrowers did have those protections. Um, we've seen similar issues with like PS, the PSLF waiver, um, just it, there being an issue with fell borrowers knowing how to consolidate or that they have to consolidate their loans to take advantage of that waiver um, and being told by servicers that they shouldn't consolidate. Um, so just thinking about thinking back to like how these like these subgroups of borrowers are just being sort of left behind from all of these really great initiatives on their face. I, I was also hoping to um, uh, turn back sort of Deanna raised the the timeline um, and some and uh, there's some sequencing issues and I think sequencing of all these various programs is a, a huge issue so um, so uh, like I said I, I, I hope fresh start will be implemented soon on the other hand if you know if the Department of Education is waiting for word from the White House on whether um, some significant portion of student debt is going to be canceled for all borrowers maybe it makes sense to wait like let's not let's not ask borrowers in default. Um, who have often complicated lives to jump through a bunch of hoops to get out of default if their balance is going to be um, is going to be fully canceled through through executive action. Uh, it would be much better to you know move forward with the executive action and, and then um, and then then push into to um, uh, working with borrowers to to get their loans removed from from default uh, for for those you know for the portion of any portion of borrowers that are that are left in default after after that action. Similarly, there's figuring out how to how to sequence in a in a way that that makes sense for borrowers and for the administration and for the ability of servicers to sort of meet the demands of the system. Um, uh, the, the, the public service loan forgiveness temporary waiver, the IDR account adjustment, um, the extension of the payment pause, and ideally also implementation of the Future Act and the new um, the new income driven repayment program that uh, that is that is in, in the works at the Department of Education. You know, I, ideally when when um, when the student loan system turns back on, uh, if we're you know tying this back to to borrowers in default, we would want any borrowers who are who still remain after any cancellation to have a really smooth pathway out of out of default and into an income driven repayment plan that is ideally like 
the best, the newest best income driven repayment plan. Um, and ideally for the future act to be implemented so that uh, so that they can easily access that repayment plan and stay into it. So we don't just suddenly have borrowers falling back into default because um, because we put them back into a system before we fixed it. Those are great points because there are lots of programs that need to work together in order for it to make sense. And, and I wonder if you guys are hearing anything about whether we could see an extension to July 2023, because that is when a lot of the negotiated rules are supposed to come into effect, the ones that would affect this population in part. I, I haven't heard, heard rumors, but I think that would be a great idea. Um, yeah, I, I, really like it. I, think, I think getting getting these, uh, you know, I've always said we should fix the system before we turn it back on. One of the one of one of several benefits of the payment pause is it gives us an opportunity to sort of, uh, you know, while the pipes are turned off, try, try to try to repair them. Um, that's the easiest time to do it, and uh, ideally, then you you turn back on a system that is a a, a new improved system. Um, and in terms of, uh, I, I would say that that at this point, given that there hasn't been any notification to borrowers that they're going to be expected to make payments um, on, on September first, uh, I would hope that they are extending the payment pause. Um, and uh, borrowers, borrowers everywhere, hope for news on that soon. Yeah, I, I just want to underscore that last point. How important that is. Um, you know, I don't I don't have any special insight into whether it's going to be extended or not, but to not give borrowers sufficient heads up that this is restarting, um, I think would be a nightmare. I think people, you know, for the, when the department does restart payments, um, I think it's going to be important for the department to have a lot of communication with borrowers and uh, to do so well in advance of it restarting. Deanne, this question is actually for you. Can you explain your idea about shifting how education is paid for from students taking out and repaying loans to using tax and payroll system to recover federal investment in education? Um, sure, and, and I'll, I'll, I'll try to be quick and then, and, and actually, um, and then, you know, I, I write more in detail, but, I, but I'm actually not changing. I, I love the idea of changing the way education is paid for. Um, but that's not what my proposal is. I think um, to some extent, even though I think we need to start over, um, I'm, I'm taking some factors as, as, you know, kind of loans will continue at some level for a while. Um, so my proposal is, you know, after the pause is lifted, after there's comprehensive debt cancellation, you know, I'd like to see like, that means all of the student loans are gone. I mean, debt is gone, let's say. Um, but regardless, even if that happens, there, there are going to be loans going forward. And so my, even though I'd like to see much less debt finance education and lots of ways to change how uh, higher education is paid for in this country, this proposal is about once you actually um, do have to take out some uh, debt or th there's still a system where you do, um, on the back end, repayment is fully through uh, tax filing. So only once a year when you, um, when you do your tax filing, if you're required to file taxes, if you're not required to file taxes, you actually don't have to pay your student loans either that year. Um, it's, it's, it's a universal income driven repayment plan um, with a, it's not one that currently exists because there'd be a much more generous floor. Um, and there'd be, um, there's other countries have a system. This is not my idea. I want to be clear um, that uh, it's, it's sort of a, a hybrid idea of what people do in other countries. I would retain some defenses, including for fraud and sort of borrow defense type defense because of the you know, massive predatory sector that we have in our country, um, which even though there are predatory schools in other country, ours, our country is unfortunately you know, a, a, a sad leader in that area. Um, so, so the idea would be that um, it's an annual payment system then. So it doesn't even, there's no acceleration. So it doesn't accumulate year to year. Um, so that each year you have a payment due that's affordable um, and there is some potential collection just of that payment if you don't pay it that year, but then you start over again every year um, with a forgiveness, uh, you know, with a forgiveness and light at the end of the tunnel period. Um, so that's, I mean, that's, that's the general idea. There's, there's a lot more uh, detail in my paper and, you know, um, anyone who's interested, I'm, I'm happy to talk more about it.
Thank you for that, Deanne. I, there are a number of questions about uh, spousal permission within IDR. I'm hoping maybe one of our panelists can talk about this is one specific question. IDR also suffers from confusion over spousal permission needed to disclose joint tax filing uh, income and concern that spouse is somehow liable for their student debt. This concerns and confuses borrowers and their spouses. Does anyone see Ed dropping the spousal permission or otherwise solving this issue? I know the problem, I don't, but someone else would know whether you think there's any chance they're gonna drop it. Does anyone Does anyone know? Did it come up in the, the you guys who did the NEGREG, did it come up at all? Josh? During public comment briefly, but um, not any substance during the conversation, at least that I can recall. I don't have any special insight either. I, like I, I know that um, there's like the, the Joint Consolidation Loan Separation Act passed the Senate recently. I don't know that it'll pass the House, but something interesting to follow. Can you tell us a little bit about what that act accomplishes? Uh, yes, I will confess that I am uh, not super in the weeds on it, so I'm just going to read. Um, Legislation to provide much needed relief for individuals who previously consolidated their student loan debt with a spouse. Um, definitely a, a gra like fertile ground for more uh, work to be done. All of us just wanted to put that on folks' radar. Yeah, and that's, and that's separate from IDR. Those are those joint consolidation loans where um, even in, you know, it's joint and several liability. So even in divorced couples, you know, still end up uh, not being able to kind of unravel that uh, joint, that particular joint debt. Um, so, so that program, uh, that's really kind of correcting a, a, a prior wrong, which is important. So it's, um, thank you for mentioning, you know, for bringing that up, Amber. I think the, you know, the, the IDR question is, there's a lot, I think, of problems to, to deal with in terms of how married, married borrowers and their filing status are treated in IDR versus, you know, single and or, or married borrowers who, who file taxes, you know, um, singly and all that sort of thing. So um, that's one of the many problems with the mechanics of IDR. So, but I, again, um, Josh and Persis were on the negotiated rulemaking and I, there was a lot of issues that came up with IDR and um, that particular one, I guess, so far as at least in any, unless anyone else knows otherwise um, is not top of the priority list. Yeah, sorry to get my consolidations mixed up. No, 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 that's a really important issue too. I mean, it's the same general concern and um, you know, we at least, um, there's also a lot of issues with domestic, um, we've certainly seen with domestic violence where you know, really uh, somebody, particularly if you have an, a, an abusive partner or spouse or something where you need them to sign on to something in order to get a particular program. Um, there were some built-in protections for that at one point, but um, that's another one of those, um, not in all the programs and it's an operational problem, a lot of cases too. And so, you know, at a minimum getting that joint consolidation uh, legislation passed, that would help with that particular problem, but you'd still have the problem with these, you know, IDR programs where both spouses often have to provide information. So just a, a quick point, um, I believe the negotiators wanted to get rid of spousal income requirement, but the Department of Education did not. Uh, so you can write them <laughs> if you have considered concerns, which it seems like many of our, our, our uh, audience do about that particular point. I also was hoping we could talk a little bit more about social security wage garnishment. I believe a few years back, there was a bill in place trying to at least lower the threshold and lower the amount, but it didn't quite uh, go anywhere. But one of the questions from our audience is, given that there are ways to get out of social security garnishment, rehab, consolidation into an IDR plan, why are so many people still getting their social security garnish? Seems like Ed or total, it seems like a total service or failure. Why can't the department do a focused triage on all of the social security garnished accounts to get them out of default and into an IDR plan? Well, 
Yeah, I mean, so I could say, and you're right, the legislation was to at least, like I mentioned, it, you know, increase the floor, that $9,000 for Social Security, which was set in 1996. Um, but, you know, as we've talked about getting people out of default right now under the existing programs, they're, they're one time each, you know, rehabilitation consolidation. So if they're going to use those traditional tools to do it, I mean, we think they can use other tools like Fresh Start, but, you know, they'd have to do that potentially repeatedly. But if they're going to use the traditional tools potentially without maybe, you know, first of all, someone has the individual has to be involved in that, uh, uh, and and there's such a high redefault rate for those things that like that's not like a long term solution to that either. Um, so it's it's a good idea at least as a start. Um, but I think that another another way to deal with another way to deal with that in addition to um, yeah getting people out of default, but knowing that potentially they're going to redefault under the current system. Um, would be increasing the, the floor, like we said, the exemption amount. But the other thing that I, and I mentioned this in my paper, um, the, the uh, department has discretion to return seized amounts to people. So I'd like to see just automatically, um, you know, presumptively, declare presumptively a hardship to have your EITC seized or to have your social security seized. If, if you want to set some sort of limit up to a certain amount on social security maybe, but I would just say to have it seized is, is like presumptively a hardship. And so even though they actually are required to certify these debts to the Department of Treasury, assuming they go through the rigor that they need to, um, there's actually nothing preventing them from uh, returning it to people um, other than their own informal guidelines. So that's another way to at least, these are all you know, stop gap measures and I think Cumulatively, we should put them together, but that would be a way at least to get some of the most vulnerable people the, the funds back um, that they need. And so I don't want to be repetitive, but I do think this question presents an opportunity to again step back and allow us to ask, you know, why was Social Security created in the first place? Well, there was a significant portion of older individuals who were falling into poverty, and so we wanted to create this safety net. And so I think it's another place where we can just more generally ask ourselves, why are we using benefits that were designed to keep people out of poverty to pay back loans that were similarly designed to do the same? That is a great point. Uh, I've been told we have 10 minutes allotted for more questions and answers. We, we do have quite a few questions. I will uh, pull this one from the audience. Um, this one audience member is concerned about her daughter uh, inheriting her loan debt. Is this a, a real possibility? And if so, uh, is there a way to avoid her inheriting her debt? It, there's not an explanation as to whether it's parent plus or federal private, but maybe you guys could just kind of go over the differences of how that would work given those different types of loans. Yeah, I mean, I guess, you know, I always say this with you know, the good news is that there's a death discharge um, on, uh, I, I, don't, I don't mean that glibly because obviously it's just like, it's crazy because, you know, there's no statute of limitations, but, um, you know, your loans are, your federal loans are discharged at death. Um, and although, you know, someone has to apply for it and, and they're, believe it or not, there was actually at one point an audit where they were worried that there was abuse in the death discharge program, but you know, that's like, that's another story, but, but at least um, on the federal loan side, that should not be a problem as far as parent plus, when I say federal loans taken out by the student borrower, um, the plus loans, parent plus loans are, you know, debts that the parents themselves take out, the student borrower is not obligated to repay those. Um, sometimes they're joint, you know, if there's two parents. And so in that case, you know, um, the, the other parent, could potentially still be, you know, could still owe. Um, the, um, the private loans are different. And so they're treated the way that other debts are that uh, go, go through an, into an estate. And so depending on, you know, various probate laws and other things, you know, it's possible that the debt actually will be something that will have to be paid like through a probate process. 
So another audience question, what do you think is the biggest reason why the administration has not already made the fixes proposed in the series by our esteemed panelists? Is it a lack of capacity, willingness, understanding of the harm of the current system or something else? Um, th there may there may be some all of the above. I, I will say first. Um, I'll start with a compliment. The the depart current administration I think is um, is trying to do a lot to reform a broken system that they inherited, and there are a lot of pieces, and it takes a lot of work. Um, and I think they're working, um, or I think that they're they're making making efforts towards improvement and. To some degree, the in some ways, the administration is constrained. Some of the proposals put forth would require legislative action, uh, especially the sort of more big picture rethinking of um, the, the approach to, to uh, student loans and the student loan system. We would need Congress to, to do. But, but yes, there's, there's absolutely more that, the, um, that could be done on an administrative level and should be done on an administrative level. Um, I, I fear sometimes that um, defaulted student loan borrowers are not a powerful political voice. Uh, you know, we've talked before about the demographics of who has student loans in default. Um, and it's overwhelmingly, you know, groups of people who are, um, who are politically marginalized. Uh, so they don't have the strongest voice uh, in our government um, and, and pushing for, for government action, and government reform. Um, so, you know, I'm I'm grateful. I'm grateful to SBPC for for having this series and, and shining a, a spotlight on the problems of default. I think more attention needs to be paid to it. I think all of all of those of us who are engaged in the, the student loan system as stakeholders of various types sort of owe it to the, the system and to the people who are most harmed by the system to continue to focus attention on on these problems and to listen to borrowers and default and share their stories. Um, and uh, hopefully, hopefully we can get there. Yeah, I mean, I would just add, I agree with Abby, first of all, that, um, you know, there, there are some, some definitely well-intentioned people who are trying to do things um, um, and they've inherited, you know, a broken system, but, but, uh, but to be clear, it's, you know, it's a bipartisan broken system. This has gone through years now of, and you know I've been around long enough to see more administrations than others that um, you know repeated mistakes. And so um, we do need congressional action. We we do need you know the good intent of efforts of various people. But I don't think you know that that's enough. Um, and I would just say that I think one thing I've seen on that that bipartisan idea that, and I wrote about this a little bit in my paper that. Um, I do think that there's, um, it's not just like a revolving door problem, which is true, but there's a real cautiousness about, um, you know, seeming to extend relief to people who aren't what they consider, who people who they, they don't consider to be deserving. Um, and I think that's, you know, a problem with, with the way our sort of social net programs are created generally. But it's it's a real it's a problem I've seen enough over the years you know at the Department of Education that um, that's I think what often prevents them from you know opening up these programs to you know um, uh, to, to without all of these kind of supposedly limiting rules to make them more automatic even if some people who they think of it's subjective honestly are not deserving potentially get them. And I think kind of like that mentality is so pervasive that I really think like even the people who are trying to do well right now are really stuck in that. And it would help a lot if we could kind of move beyond that. And just to echo again, like the appreciation for the department's initiatives, like the PSL off waiver, the IDR account adjustment, the fresh start, like all of those in a row, like it, that's amazing to see so much like that the department and the administration is, is is thinking about these about borrowers so much and the harms they face but because these are all sort of like just band-aids on a like a gaping wound um it's like there are still borrowers who are caught 
between the like the like the crevices of these of these piecemeal solutions like we had the um pslf um the audience member with the question about i'm in default but i'm also eligible or i should be eligible for the pslf waiver and what do i do and they're like that borrower is not alone there are countless borrowers who are caught between these like these great ideas and great programs but because there's not systemic reform they're still not they're not benefiting so i'll just quickly underscore dan's comment um and i think the mindset and that you just described was uh, very present kind of in all aspects of the negotiated rulemaking this last time around um where there is there does seem to be this mindset that it would be far worse to give one person who who doesn't deserve relief and their relief than to ensure that thousands of people get relief even if that one person slipped by um, and, and i i concur that a shift in that mindset is needed moving forward For our audience who may not be privy to all of the uh, twists and turns of, of negotiated rulemaking, I was hoping maybe the folks who were a part of it or were paying close attention could talk a little bit about if there are any promising aspects on the default front that are coming out that came out of, of those meetings or that you think the department may try to address in um, any of its rulemaking, particularly with IDR. So, at least as a, so, so I'll start by saying there's a lot from the negotiated rulemaking um, where the department is now putting forward proposals that are very strong. Um, you know, obviously there's places for improvement, um, but um, for example, where there was consensus on like TPD and false certification and interest capitalization, I think we, we ended in a really strong place. On default specifically, um, so Persis did a heroic job of trying to get the department to focus on defaulted borrowers and the need to provide additional pathway out of default through an IDR program and to just you know, create the best possible IDR program that could possibly exist for borrowers who are not currently in default or for those borrowers who are moved out of default. Um, the department on that continually pointed um, to other rulemaking that they're uh, going to be engaged in on debt collection practices. Um, that is not subject to negotiated rulemaking, so we don't really, or at least I don't have any real insight into what they're thinking on that. Um, and then, you know, I think negotiators were not thrilled with where the proposed IDR package ended up, but um, I think Again, Persis in particular uh, did an incredible job of emphasizing all of the ways in which the department needs to kind of go back to the drawing board and come back when they issue the NPRM on it um, with something that really will make a meaningful difference. Um, so I think, I think at least on that, um, we're in a, a holding pattern until they release an NPRM on the IDR portion specifically. Thank you for that wrap up. So I'll just close out our session by allowing the panelists to have a final word. I would love to know what do you think that we should be paying closer attention to as we think about ways to reimagine def the def debt collection system? Um, what are you hoping to see in uh, the coming years through this administration that has already demonstrated a willingness to start addressing some of these issues? Perhaps not as far as many would like, but uh, more of a willingness than perhaps past administrations. Any closing remarks? Don't all start at once. <laughs> I will call on someone. <laughs> I was gonna say, I feel like I've said so much that I don't, so, um, so I, I don't, you know, I, I would just make that point one more time that um, I think the mentality shift is like essential to keep the programs preserved. And that means make them more automatic, make them simpler. And in the meantime, you know, use the tools that you have department to at least like alleviate the pain um, for people who are suffering the most. 
So the details are, are you know, um, in the paper and elsewhere. I think I'll end on just two quick points. Um, the first is, you know, I think this administration has prioritized uh, racial justice and creating a more equitable student loan system. Um, and I would posit that the system as it exists right now on the debt collection side of things is uh, as far away from realizing a racially just vision of that system as possible. Um, and then you know, the second point I would end with is just how interconnected all of the pieces are here. And so, you know, yes, we need to go back to the drawing board on this piece of the system. But for something like Fresh Start, what does it actually mean when we're giving someone a fresh start if we're just throwing that, them back into a system um, that isn't, isn't working? Um, and with that, we'll just thank, thank SBPC again for, for providing this forum uh, for us to focus on these issues. Um. I'd like to pick up on something that I think Abby said a little bit earlier about how like we don't or politicians don't typically see like student borrowers, student loan borrowers as like a block that they need to like cater to. And I would just say like if the administration says that like they're committed to improving the student loan system, like the way to do that is focusing on the people on the margins who we think like most people aren't in default so maybe we focus more on improving the program for people who are current and in good standing but to actually improve the system we have to get those people who have been most marginalized and are struggling the most and just center them um that's what i would end on and it's been really great to be on a panel with such like experienced luminaries in this field it's great you guys are awesome um, so a quick, quick wrap up and then, um, a resource plug. Uh, so tying a few threads, I, hopefully together, um, I loved Jan's point about, um, moving away from, from the deserving language or potentially rethinking it and sort of tying it together with some of what Josh and Amber have, uh, said about the, um, about the social safety net and uh, the, the purpose of the, the student loan program um, and social security and earned income tax credit. Um, and maybe, maybe thinking of some of this in terms of sort of who deserves access to the social safety net. Um, and hopefully we would say everyone, everyone in, everyone in America deserves access to, to our country's social safety net. It's part of what, what uh, has the potential to make our country great. And it's, um, it's important in the sort of uh, particularly social security's universality um, uh, are, are things that, that, that we should all celebrate and that we should uh, fight for, for student loan borrowers to, to have access to. Um, second, I said I was going to, I was going to plug some things. Um, I, I have been remiss in not mentioning earlier today that Sarah Saddlemeyer from New America has a really great um, new analysis of uh, survey data about borrowers in default. Um, uh, survey data from, from Pew that is, I think, really uh, sheds, sheds more light and highlights some of these issues in terms of who is in default and why and sort of what is what, is, what system failures have, have led people to be in default and, um, and really making, uh, providing more, more, more data evidence that, uh, that, that people are, are experiencing default because they have severe financial constraints and they can't afford their payments. Um, and because the system is complicated and they're not getting access to the, the, the relief valves in the system that they should. Um, so uh, we'll, um, uh, sorry, did I, did, did I say the wrong thing? New America is, is, is uh, Sarah Saddlemeyer with New America. So hopefully we can share out that, that link. Um, and I also mentioned previously the importance of listening to borrowers' voices. So towards that end, I wanted to um, highlight a report that, that Purse has actually put together back, back in her, um, her days in my role uh, called Voices of Despair, where, where she, she, she just really collected and organized stories from borrowers who uh, had experienced offset of their in, earned income tax credit and shared in their own words how that impact themselves and, the, and their families. And overwhelmingly, you hear these stories of, of families um, experiencing homelessness, uh, um, uh, losing jobs, 
um, losing the ability to pay for, for, for medicine for, for, their, for their families because of these, uh, the, these offset practices. So um, I sort of challenge anyone to read that report and not, not feel the urgency of now in, in fixing this, this system and addressing these harms. Thank you everyone um, for your contributions today. And thank you to our audience for sticking with us through this really important conversation. I would love to turn it back over to Persis. Thanks again. Thank you so much, Danielle, Abby, Amber, Josh, Deanne, for this insightful conversation. I think this, this is such an important topic and one that I think that we don't talk about enough as, as has been mentioned. Um, you know, some of the, the data, some of the things that came up that I think are so important, Abby highlighted that there are more than 2 million borrowers who've been in repayment for more than 20 years and are, are in default. Um, we talked about rehabilitation and all of the programs that exist that are supposed to keep borrowers from this exact very place that we're in um, and how they're not working. And in particular, I was struck by the discussion about how the government has abdicated its responsibility to private companies. And, and does this point out the inherent conflict of interest that the department has um, in both being the regulator of federal student loans and the collector of federal student loans? Um, and the last point that I, I would really like to lift back up one more time is that there's so much data that shows that borrowers borrowers in default are low income, they're people of color, they're first generation. And, and at the end of the day, they're the folks, Josh makes this point so well, they're the folks that the Higher Education Act was meant to help. And they're the ones who are suffering the most by the hands of student loan default. And the Department of Education has at its disposal the tools to help folks. So I really wanna thank, I wanna thank our panel um, and our moderator for, for providing all of that insightful information and for such a lively conversation. I wanna thank the audience for, for as you answer, you asked so many questions, they're great questions, and I'm sorry that we could not get to them all, um, but there was great engagement. I wanna highlight a couple resources for folks because I know a, folk, a lot of folks had questions about their own student loans. The National Consumer Law Center has the student loan borrowerassistance.org website, which has a lot of good information. Um, the Student Borrower Protection Center has ForgiveMyStudentDebt.org with a lot of information about public service loan forgiveness. And I would probably be remiss to say that there is also the Department of Education has a website, studentaid.gov. Um, moving on, you know, folks, don't forget, we have two more great events for you next week, August 9th, same time. We will be joined by U.S. Department of Education Under Secretary James Qual and a panel of legal experts who are going to talk more about these tools that the department has at its disposal to help defaulted borrowers and the ways that it can use those tools. And then on the 16th, our final session, we're going to turn to the states and look at the roles that those states can play. Um, you'll find the, the link to register for those sessions in the chat. Um, and please do. Thank you again, again to our panelists. Thanks to our audience. Uh, we look forward to seeing you again next week. Take care, everyone. <laughs>